All right. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode here on the Lure Lab, a part of the Serious Angler Network. And as always, I'm your host, the captain, Andrew Full. And today we are diving into a technique that is very near and dear to my heart. And I've caught a lot of big largemouth on it and also smallmouth. And we are diving into the weedless drop shot or Texas rig drop shot. And for those who are familiar with drop shot fishing, the one that gets like all the rave in the reviews is nose hooking it but we have an awesome guest today we have Alec Morrison on coming on who seems to be taking everyone's money no matter where he's fishing in the country right now so and we're going to talk a little bit of weedless drop shotting with him because I know it's something he does all over the country so let's get more bass in the boat for you and let's bring Alec on here hey man how's it going hey dude it's going good how about you not bad you are on a roll I just want to point that out real fast. For the viewers who may not know who you are, um, you want to talk about Sam Rayburn for like 30 seconds. <laughs> yeah, sure. I love <laughs> talking about Rayburn. <laughs> uh, yeah, so back in May uh, 18th through the 20th, I had um, the Toyota Series event on Sam Rayburn. Uh, that was my first time being on that body of water. I gave myself, I believe it was 10 days to practice. Uh, did a lot of research beforehand and kind of narrowed down uh, an area of the lake that I wanted to fish. Uh, I knew I wanted to fish offshore brush piles and basically took those 10 days to graph and find as many as I could and as many high percentage ones as I could. And we ended up having an unreal event. I caught uh, 27.9 on day one and took the lead. And then on day two, I had over 30 pounds with uh, two deceased ones, unfortunately, hot water, nothing I could really do, but I ended up weighing 29, nine on day two. And then, uh, I didn't have to catch a bass on the third day to win, but still <laughs> went out there and caught uh, 16 and change and, and got the win. It was unreal. You're like, oh, let's just go have some fun today and do some <laughs> random stuff and see if we can catch them any other yeah. way. How did the drop really shot? Did the drop shot play for you at all on Rayburn or was it some other sneaky technique? Uh, definitely played. Not so much in practice, more so because in practice we had a lot of wind, cloud cover, rain off and on. And I was able to get away with a lot more power fishing techniques. Um, but as the tournament uh, showed up and progressed throughout the days, all three days, it really turned into, uh, well, minus the third day, the first two days. Uh, it was basically just dead flat, no high wind, and, and, yeah, and high sun. And that really forced me to slow down. And And this presentation is one that I not only used there in those brush piles during the event, but, man, I throw it on Oneida, Champlain, Cayuga. This yeah. past weekend, I caught quite a few on Cayuga doing this. And, you ever uh, bubba shot it, like, with a heavier weight down in florida through the grass yeah you definitely could i need to mess with like punching it or something yeah. a little more probably because hookup ratio can be an issue with the two ounce you know in front of your hook so it's like one thousand percent it's something that and it, i guess it falls into like the weedless drop shot category and we're going to talk about what it is here in a second but with like bait casting gear what i found is going like a 30 pound braid mm -hmm. and like a 12 foot leader you yeah. can go 17 pound test on the leader. Yeah. You just go to like a standard EWG hook and you can basically like punch grass with it. Well, flip yeah. grass in like 10 to 12 foot with like a brush hog. Yeah. And yeah. come unglued on it. Oh, so, that's the deal. Plus, braid the leader is so nice for like yeah. those kind of applications too. Because you don't even have to hit them really. You can just like yeah. set. So, but. I want to hear from your perspective here because this show isn't about me rambling. But Alec, what is a weedless drop shot for our viewers who may not know what it is? You know, your your basic drop shot, uh, in my mind, is just going to be like a round, uh, whether it's tungsten or lead, like a round, a round weight, and uh, typically, you know, like a foot to two foot of leader in between the hook, and then a, a small nose hook. Um, a lot of people like to just nose hook baits. And if you're fishing deeper water and around, you know, sparse cover, that's a really good option. Um, you know, smaller hook, it's gives the bait a little bit more action being, 
nose hook and uh, it's really good for those just deep water kind of small mouth applications um but one thing we have a lot of here in new york is either grass or grass and rock mix and on certain lakes like champlain and oneida you get a lot of uh, that grass and rock mix maybe less than like 20 foot so certain times of the year um instead of me throwing uh more so of an offshore style drop shot uh, i'm gonna be switching towards one of two different variations of weedless drop shot and um the first one is really gonna kind of be for those light grass areas maybe you know like i said the grass and rock mix um and there's one hook in particular i use for this scenario and it is the owner or excuse me the uh, hayabusa 10 ftp and this is a straight shank it's essentially a flipping hook with a keeper is it really light wire then it's it's a little slightly heavier wire than if you're familiar with the um, owner cover shot. Yeah. So owner cover shot's a good one if you're looking to, uh, you know, do the same technique. Uh, however, I tend to like the FPP just a little more because it's a tiny bit heavier gauge wire. And it, has, it doesn't flex. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't flex. And, uh, you know, they... They don't make it in like a number two or anything. This is the smallest one they make, which is a 1-0, but it's still a really good size. Has a good keeper. And what I like most about this hook in that light grass or grass and rock mixture is that, let's say I'm kind of thrown to some clumps and I have this thing rigged weedlessly like this, you know, no, no hook point is exposed i can get it in and around grass um, and work it clean through there but let's say i get this is kind of like a champlain or oneida thing you get to like a little patch of clean rock with no no grass around or you get in an area with a lot less grass i will take this hook if i don't have to worry about the grass that much and that wasn't the straightest of rigging but i will actually just take it and immediately just thread my bait on there that's something I've been a proponent of for a long time. I started doing it on Champlain, like literally probably like eight years ago. And um, it's really good for just keeping some of those fish pinned. Um, maybe they're short striking the bait a little bit, not eating it too good. Now your hook is halfway further back. Um, so that's kind of like a benefit towards using this hook for that scenario is if you're not dealing with just really thick grass in general you know kind of some sparse stuff mixed cover you're you get able more to... uses out of your bait too exactly exactly so you know you can you can change it up uh on the fly if need be and then secondary option i will typically go with let's say it's going to be a little bit larger worm if i'm just targeting something like milfoil clumps on cayuga like isolated clumps of milfoil i'm gonna line myself up on scope throw this drop shot directly into the middle of the clump and uh really just need to make sure this one's getting through grass at all times i'll often make the change this is something new i've been doing uh hayabusa makes a a it's called the Worm 114 hook. They make it in a regular version and the HD version. But one thing I've been messing around a lot with is using just a 10 or a 20 round bend uh, on these little bit larger worms, your 5 inch, your 7 inch. Uh, those are typically the ones I'll go for uh, fishing grass like that on Cayuga. Is that, and you're doing it all on a spinning rod setup, obviously. So, yeah. like, is that a lighter, like a lighter wire worm hook in that WRM? What you said, 114? Yes, this is the 114, and then which is the lighter version. And then the HD would be uh, the heavier diameter wire. Got it. Um, it's not super light, you know. It's you, you probably on a spin rod, I feel like even with a five pounder on Cayuga, if you like play your cards correctly. I don't think you could straighten the hook out at all, um, oh, even good. with the non-HD version. Um, but yeah, with this NRB coating, 
it's the real slick hook and for those braid to leader applications and stuff like this it really excels um, it penetrates through the worm really easily because of that coat seems like it just gets exposed quicker and you know it doesn't take as much force with the hooks to, to, to get a good hook into them yeah, I, I recently started messing around with Hayabusa hooks, and I found the it was a w, WRM nine fifty six like EWG. Yeah, yep. I mean, yep. like my favorite like stick bait. Oh hook. yeah, and the thing is wicked. I put almost put through my hand a few times on accident. So Dude, they are very sharp. They are yes. I don't like like their standard drop shot nose hook, mm -hmm. drop shot hook. I have other ones I like for that, but. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna check those out because I like those hooks. They sound good. So and yeah, I like I can, with it. I can attest for the one one four, or they make one that's slightly different. And instead of it just being this round bend worm hook, um, it's called the nine fifty seven. Mm -hmm. It is uh, similar in shape. It's a worm hook, but it has the uh, O'Shaughnessy style bend mm -hmm. as opposed to just the round bend. And that one's been a really good one in Florida with like a six inch worm, Sanko, like a speed worm. That mm -hmm. hook has been really good. Um, but yeah, I can definitely attest to this one. And it's been cool to kind of, you know, I, I have both these variations, but definitely been messing a lot more with this 1.0 or 2.0 worm hook on the drop shot. It stays really weedless. Um, you probably don't rip as many baits as maybe having the keeper on a straight yeah. shank or something like that. Um, so it seems to keep it in place really well. And like that. one other thing that I forgot to mention about both, and this may not make the biggest difference. It's just something that I like to do is on this original setup um, for the rock and grass kind of mix lighter areas. If there's any rock involved, I typically will use the bell shape uh, style weight. This one happens to be a range drop shot weight. This is a 3 16 tungsten. Um, I'll typically use that. I feel like with that shape, I get a, like a little better contact around rock and mm -hmm. also the lightweight. You'll get, a, you'll get a little more feel out of it. But with the secondary one, if I'm throwing this one directly into a grass clump, I oftentimes will go straight for the close like cylinder. cylindrical weight. Yep. So this one is a quarter ounce. It doesn't look like it. It's extremely small, super thin, has a closed eye, so you're able to you're able to uh, you know tie your line directly to it. Um, don't have to worry about the clip cutting it or anything. Now, which one do you like more, the clip or the closed eye tie? I have my preference, so I figured I would ask you first. Yeah, I guess it depends on the scenario, really. Um, as far as losing weights, the tie-on is probably better. Um, if I am just, let's say I'm drifting on the river, though, or something, and I want to, like, I get hung, and I'm in a tournament, like, I'll probably, I like the clip because you can just break the weight off. And yeah. I can reel up. Well, tungsten is so up. expensive. If you just want to break them off, you should be using lead, right? Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no doubt. I'm definitely a lead guy and about 90% of the time, but I bust out the tungsten in the tournament. Oh, hundred percent. I I um I only use like when I'm out deep because I don't get too large mouth fish like fisheries all that much, but like hmm. I'm I'm all about like the teardrop, but it has to be closed. Uh, gotcha. I, yeah. it, I just feel like one, you don't lose as many weights and for mm -hmm. whatever reason, when I tie a knot on, I feel like I have more sensitivity but that, it could uh, be a small mind thing for me. No, so, that's interesting. But we're talking about drop shotting. We're not talking about me. What is your setup, Alec? For like your rod reel, braid mm -hmm. to floro, straight yeah. floro. So I'm definitely not a straight floro guy. I can tell you that. <laughs> but <laughs> But, um, you know, with this kind of rock and grass mixture, um, I'm going to be throwing this one probably on your typical drop shot rod, whether it's a 610 to 7.4 medium with an extra fast tip, um, whatever your preference is. Um, 
you know, and that's mostly because I may be working it around some grass. I may have that hook threaded on there and a little more open water. Um, as far as line, that's pretty standard as well, too. I'll do like a 10 to 12 pound braid um, with a usually a 10 to 12 pound floral leader. Um, a lot of guys like super light line where I am. I don't know why. They bite 12. I'm pretty sure I could drop shot on champlain with like 17 and they'd still bite it totally fine. so here's my thought process on it i feel like if you're texas rigging or weedless rigging a drop mm -hmm. shot you can get away with heavier line because when yeah. you're dead sticking that bait it's still the tail action of that bait is still going to wiggle regardless mm -hmm. i feel like when you go to a nose hook in ultra clear water that's when you need to go with the lighter line yeah totally i, I completely agree it's definitely based around the hook um but yeah, I mean, braid the leader, like I said, 10 to 12 pound braid, the 10 to 12 pound leader. Um, and then the only change I'll make up really on the, on this setup with the 114 and the cylindrical weight for specifically like grass clumps, that one I typically will use a longer rod and a little bit heavier rod. Uh, I'll, the one in particular I fished that one on, uh, that setup on is the, uh, the Miller rods bass freak. And the bass freak is interesting because it is kind of built like a drop shot rod, but it's seven, seven. So you have a lot more added length with it and it's good for like castability and overall just like picking up line and coming tight to fish. Lots of leverage too, I would yeah, assume. Yeah. There's a lot of added power with that length, regardless of the rod not being all that heavy. Uh, anyways, you still do get a lot of added power. So that's definitely a big one is kind of getting them up and out of some of those some of those grass clumps if they're a little thicker and just ease of fighting them, basically. And you have the little bit heavier line and leader. I'll probably I don't think I'll go down to 10 pound on this. It'll probably be 12 to 12 or 12 to 15 liter uh cayuga is a place i fish this a lot and uh, well on sam rayburn as well i didn't use any 10 pound liter it was all like 12 to 15 but the water was definitely uh slightly more slightly stained mm -hmm. so it's not like it was i was ever hurting uh hurting my chances of getting a bite by going a little heavier it only really benefited me um, so yeah, I guess that's one take, you know, maybe yeah. step it up a little more than you typically would on your leader, on your, uh, leader strength. And, uh, you know, if they're not really reacting to it all that well, or if you feel like the water's clear enough to where you might have to downsize, then do it, but maybe just go a little heavier, uh, in yeah. the beginning. I like it. So <clears throat> talk about your setup. We talked about basically how to rig it right like let's talk about some of your favorite baits to weedless drop shot with but also to add a secondary twist into it like what colors you'll choose based on the conditions mm -hmm. yeah so between colors i really like to keep it simple like i'll basically look at it as either hey i need to go with a natural color this happens to be Color, Japanese color called scuppernong. It's like a really, it's like a dark reddish brown. This thing works like all over. Clean water, dirty water, it doesn't really matter. Quiet doesn't on that scuppernong, man. Come on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, basically, the other end of the spectrum, and this is one that works really good on Cayuga, is just uh, some places they just really like a morning dawn colored worm on a drop shot. And uh, it's basically just going to be one or the other for me. I'm not going to um, really think about it all all too hard on the color. Um, a lot of times it ends up being more of a spot thing. But, but yeah, as far as the watercolor, you know, I'm basically going to try both a real natural pattern and then, you know, maybe a couple that aren't so natural. And just You're a big one. You might be one of the only people I know that throw a bubbling shaker still. Yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like yeah. it's a bait that's kind of like disappeared from like the limelight. Like, but it came to America what, like 12 years ago, I think, yeah. 10, 12 yeah. years ago. And yeah. people talked about it and loved it. And then basically, once the flatworm started coming mm-hmm. about and a couple other ones, even like when the robo worm started being talked about on the East Coast more, yeah, I feel like the bubbling shaker kind of went underneath. But I know that thing catches fish. I have yeah. some, so it really does. And the cool thing I like about it is it comes in a three inch, a three and a half, a four, a five, a seven, and a ten. So it's like yeah. the options are pretty endless. And over the years, they've uh, opened up and expanded their colors. And you have all kinds of clean water colors, all kinds of dirty water colors. And even though it is like a worm style shape, they even make it in like four different shad patterns, like natural shad kind of patterns. So it's really cool. It's just, it's always one that I have tied on, uh, whether it's a, typically it's the four and the five and the seven, the most, yeah. um, but yeah, it's just such a good profile. It moves good, good colors. And you're definitely right. Like a lot of people don't really talk about it anymore. But is it a pretty like, neutrally buoyant bait, if I remember correctly, yeah. too? Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, th- these pockets catch a lot of lot of air and a lot of water. And it really moves good and stays floating. So so that I think that's a key that we should like talk about here real fast mm-hmm. is how important it is to have a neutrally buoyant bait when you are weedless drop shotting because you want that bait to be horizontal yeah. to the bottom, right? Like if you're dead sticking it there, you don't want that bait falling down and getting, getting wrapped around. More. Yeah. yeah, you're not going to get any bites. You need something that stays very neutrally buoyant. And I think hook size is kind of important too based on the size of the worm you use because if you use too big of a hook on too small of a bait, that can cause it to fall and do weird things as well so oh totally totally yeah once you match the uh you know correct hook size the worm and and all that for the situation it the swarm is definitely beneficial in that in that sense where it is gonna it's gonna stay upright and you're gonna be able to dead stick it and it'll stay in that position um and yeah it's just uh it's definitely a it's definitely efficient. You know, the drop shot, everybody knows it, everybody uses it. But at the same time, uh, there's so many ways you could rig it based on what you're doing. And um, oftentimes, some small changes in the way you're presenting it uh, will get you a lot more bites. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to hit you with the last question here, Alec, and I'm going to let you go. But real quick, I do have to throw this in there. Do it molds. The question is the juice of the show, so all our viewers know about it. But they do make a drop shot mold, so you can pour all of your own lead drop shot weights. And they have a kit over there for it, I do believe. Mm. And that will save you some money as opposed to using tungsten. But it is a great idea to use lead for practice or if you're just recreational fishing every single weekend or once a month so you don't spend hundreds of dollars on tungsten product but the do it molds juice of the show alec is why should someone always have a weedless drop shot tied on yeah i mean if i could uh if i could have one it would probably be you know this variation with uh the one or excuse me the 10 fpp And like I explained earlier, it's really just the efficiency of it. You know, a lot of these lakes up north, we got, you know, if you're fishing uh, less than 20 foot, essentially, there's going to be a lot of like grass and rock mix. And whether it's smallmouth on Champlain getting in grass and rock mix or um, uh, in a couple other places like Cayuga and Oneida, you might have some largemouth mixed in there. This is just overall a really good one for you to be able to, you know, change your presentation up based on uh, what you may be fishing around. And it won't take long at all, really. And it just the overall efficiency of having a weedless drop shot, in my opinion, or a hook like this is uh, overall just better. Um, It's good for a lot of different scenarios and it just straight up catches fish it straight up gets bites like you like you guys know a drop shot to do and yeah. now what you're doing is you're just putting it in places that some other people aren't putting a drop shot 
Yeah. And I think that's important too, is like mm -hmm. you can go and fish a weed line with it and kind of tinker with how deep in the weeds you want to go based on how sparse or thick they are and what your confidence is oh. and just kind of mess with your line setup, go heavier in line, heavier weight. Mm -hmm. You can even go to a bait caster, which yeah. I think I'm going to do in the future a Bubba shotting episode because that's something that I really enjoy doing. So there are times and places for that. So that'll be in the future, but Alec, I want to say thank you for taking the time and joining us. And hopefully maybe this fall, one day as you're swinging through Buffalo, we can get out on Erie and go catch some smallies. Dude, that would be cool. You know, it won't be long and I'll be uh, heading to the Toyota Series Championship here in uh, some short weeks. And then uh, that might be a really rad time to stop through because yeah. I'll be driving or, right by. Or on the way home, one or the yeah. other, unless you go to Florida afterwards. Yeah, I might I might be ripping over to Florida afterwards, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. We'll we'll chat. But I want to say thank you again for taking the time out. I know we tried to make this happen a couple <laughs> weeks ago, but we had some technical difficulties. So yeah. Thanks no, again, glad. man. Hey, thanks for having me on, Andy. I of appreciate course. it. Go catch him up and take some more people's monies and we'll be uh, rooting for me over <laughs> on this side. So we'll talk Excellent. soon, buddy. Yep, hey, of course. Thanks. See Have you. a good one. Bye. All right, everyone. Well, thanks for tuning into this week's episode here on the Lure Lab, where we had Alec Morrison on, who just, like I started from the beginning, it just seems to be taking everyone's money in the Toyota series and the BFLs. I don't think he's had a bad tournament yet this, this year and been out of the money. And it, it's kind of cool to see like the transition in the fishing industry where we have all these greats that have been around a while. Now we have all these up and coming young guns who just absolutely catch the fire out of them. So, but as always, if you're on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, leave a comment down below. If you fish a weedless drop shot, maybe what even your favorite baits are for the weedless drop shot presentation. If you're on Spotify or Apple or your favorite podcast platform, please leave us a review. If that platform allows you to do so, that allows us best podcast bass fishing podcast to be seen by more people like you and i alike and as always we appreciate everyone who tunes in and we will see you next saturday